So I think really we've got to start monitoring all the impacts of the oil, all the possible impacts. <clears throat> Any bird that, that happens to, to die, you know, over the next certainly six months, maybe even 12, should be carefully assessed to see if, um, if you know, that has been as a result of, of the oil in order to ascertain what the impact of the uh, whole ecosystem is. Hello, my name is Sasha Dench, but I'm better known as the human swan. I'm also the UN's ambassador for the Convention on Migratory Species. This year, the charity I founded, Conservation Without Borders, is launching a new expedition to follow the flight of the osprey, an epic migration of 10,000 kilometers through 14 countries from Europe to West Africa. As a part of this, we're doing a series of podcasts to highlight the global stories and connections this bird makes to help us see our complex and challenged world through the eyes of this incredible animal. In this episode, I speak to Lewis of the Nautilus Project about the ship collision and oil spill that has just happened in the Strait of Gibraltar. And given that this is right at the most important bottleneck for migration and peak of the migration season, how that could impact the osprey and other animals, including us. Uh, thanks for um, yeah agreeing to be part of our crazy uh, project. From a from a little message on um, via via Twitter um, to get you is great, and I guess I am I have a few questions as well. Uh, but yeah, so I guess what you mentioned that you grew up in uh, Gibraltar, but apart from that, um, what is particularly interesting for you about the Straits, about that stretch of water? It's actually my, you, you've asked me about my soapbox topic. So <clears throat> you're gonna, you just prompted me to get on my soapbox. Sorry, but uh, here in Gibraltar, we make a, you've probably heard, um, we are quite world renowned for the apes, uh, the monkeys, right? Because they're, they're actually tailless monkeys. Um, and people come from far and wide just to see the monkeys. And, and with good reason, because they're the only monkeys in Europe. Um, and so we have a nature reserve and it, it, touristically a big splash is made about that um, but I think that we really miss a trick because Gibraltar lies in the area where the Atlantic Ocean comes in in the Straits and the Mediterranean water is leaving and if you look at the species that inhabit both bodies of water they are very very different uh, almost mutually exclusive there is some crossover but the biggest crossover actually happens around Gibraltar and we get mixing of phytoplankton which we don't get in the Atlantic side or on the Mediterranean side. We get the mixing of the zooplankton, and then we get mixing of higher trophic levels, which you do not see on either side. So it's actually an incredibly special bit of water. Um, and I think that uh, from an environmental perspective, we really miss a trick by not promoting more and educating more on exactly the, the jewel that we have here. And so part of the project's work is exactly that, to you know, take it into school so that, so that kids can uh, understand that better. Obviously, for for us, the the key interest in uh, Gibraltar and the Tarifa region is due to the fact that it's a bottleneck for migration. Does that ever come into your work at all? I mean, from all the tracks we can see from basically birds that have been satellite tagged um, across northern Europe, it is incredible how the kind of peaks there really act as a funnel. And so the vast majority of all those migrating birds are flying over just that particular region. And with the osprey uh, in particular, it is uh, fishing off that coast, sometimes actually carrying fish across the Strait of Gibraltar with it, as we've now heard. Does that cross over with your work? Um, yes, it does, but not from the avian side. I mean, although the, the, uh, the birds form a, a, an important component of, of what happens, because what you're talking about is a migration from north to south. And actually, from a marine perspective, what the migration is, is from east to west or from west to east. And again, you are talking about the culmination of a lot of biomass that crisscrosses that east to west, north to south migration, bang in the Straits of Gibraltar. Again, another really important reason, and I'm glad you brought it up, as to why uh, this is such an important uh, stretch of water. Uh, biologically, what we get is the migration of bluefin tuna that come in from the Atlantic and they feed and they, they actually spawn in the Mediterranean and then they leave again. Um, so we've got that uh, species. We've also got fin whales, which are the second largest uh, mammal in, in the ocean after the uh, blue whale. And they start the migration out at about May, June time. 
uh, and you can actually see them from the beach migrating out into the Atlantic pretty much all summer long until about mid-August and it really starts to tail off after that. Um, uh, so, so it, it's, yeah, it, it, we do get lots of migrations. The birds can be indicators for starts and stops because obviously they, they, they run a very tight ship uh, uh, on their migrations, although I will caveat, it's not my area of expertise. Um, but the, 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 the marine side obviously very much meshes in with what's happening on the avian side. Fascinating. So can I ask uh, you to describe the kind of moment when you first heard that there was a ship in trouble um, off Gibraltar, which is the reason I first got in touch with you? So actually that night we had had, um, we'd been working a 14 hour day, we were both my wife and I, who, who my wife runs the charity with me and I have to say, does uh, the lion's share of all the organizing. I, I'm, uh, so, so I'm very grateful. We were just absolutely shattered and we, we turned our phones off, uh, just needed to get some rest. And the early next morning, she turned on her phone and she was like elbowing me, you gotta get up, you gotta get up, you gotta look at this. And I, I, I you know, sleepy eyed had a look at, uh, at the phone I couldn't quite believe what I was reading that overnight a, a ship had been it hadn't run aground they basically put it there um, in order to stop it sinking there'd been an accident on the west side and they had put it uh, they forced it aground uh, op opposite one of the beaches in order to prevent it sinking her cargo was steel rods but she also contained um, 500 tons of fuel, of which uh, 250 tons was diesel, uh, 215 tons was heavy fuel, and there was about an extra 27 tons uh, there thereabouts of lubricants, uh, all of which, you know, really toxic to the environment um, and of great concern. So fortunately, I think the port made the right decision to to uh, you know uh, actually run her aground uh, there. Uh, reason being, had she sunk in deeper waters, those tanks would have ruptured, and all that um, fuel would have you know come up into on, onto surface waters simultaneously, and that would have been catastrophic. You know how deep the waters are in that area if it had sunk where. Um where the accident happened. Right, so in the area where the accident happened, you're talking about um, up to about 100 meters, okay? And if you go a little bit further south, you basically have a massive cliff off uh, from about 100 meters all the way down to the bottom of the straits, which is about 800, 900 meters depth. So the tanks would almost certainly have ruptured had she slipped all the way down. On the east side, however, um, we've got a very gradual profile from the beach, which goes for about two, three miles out. You don't have more than 100 meters of water. And then you have that same drop off that you have in the south, um, dropping off or, or to about eight, 900 meters after about three miles. So she was actually brought quite close. The OS 35 is, is the vessel in question, it was brought in quite close, uh, about 700 meters from the beach. And she was uh, uh, run a, you know, aground in about 17 meters of water. Right. And so in that scenario, I guess the first thing you have to think of is what is the worst case scenario? What could happen here? And can you explain what that would be? So, so the worst... also, also assuming people don't know much about the marine world and what oil, diesel, etc. would do on water. Okay, so um, um, the worst case scenario really would have been the 500 litres of fuel spilling out simultaneously. Um, and everyone is aware, and most people are aware about how oil looks in the water. It, it floats on the water and it has, um, a, it tends to spread out as thin as possible. So what happens is with winds um, and the fact that it's trying to spread itself thin, you actually manage to cover a huge area uh, with a little bit of oil. Imagine Imagine a lot of oil, how much um, issue that causes. And everyone will be aware of the black slicks that are associated with heavy fuels. Um, and this is, you know, which affects seabirds and, uh, and other surface dwellers. Unfortunately, though, that is not the worst of it, because what tends to happen with winds is that you start getting mixing of the water column. And that oil, which wants to stay at the surface, actually starts to break up and dissipate and starts to mix within the water column. And this is actually, although it's, it's uh, less well uh, seen because they're tiny little oil droplets, it's actually the more dangerous part, because what tends to happen is it starts getting into organisms like filter feeders, like mussels, uh, uh, clams and other species which are close to the base of the food chain. 
And now what we have is bioaccumulation of the toxins uh, going through the food web, from the base of the food web, right the way through to essentially us. And, and uh, bioaccumulation says that the organisms that are at the top of the food web actually gain the highest concentration of these toxins because the, the, the toxins go concentrating as it goes through the food web. So in a roundabout way, not only do we destroy the base of the food chain, uh, at least for a while, um, but we also destroy the, the other trophic levels by through toxicity uh, as those chemicals go by accumulating. And the, the research on this shows that in order to recover after an oil spill, you're talking about at least 10 years, a decade, before the, um, the ecosystem has recovered completely from that, um, from that oil spill. So, you know, big timescales for recovery. Mm, okay, and this was happening at a bottleneck for migration uh, on a couple of different levels, but also the uh, the seafood industry in that region is also quite important, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, it's interesting, but during the period that uh, the port was closed off, uh, fishing in the area has was was banned, certainly in Gibraltar. Okay, so it shows that there is a, a direct effect. Unfortunately, the fishing has been reopened, uh, a mistake in, in my personal view, until, you know, toxicity levels in species can be ascertained. And I, I don't believe it's been done. Um, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. It, you know, fish is a very important diet in the Mediterranean. And a lot of these fish are going to be affected by, uh, by the levels of oil and water, for sure. Mm -hmm. So are you aware exactly what, what did happen in the end? I mean, I've seen from the aerial images that the ship or somebody managed to put a bund around the ship. It was, was leaking. Um, so some of it was captured and there were boats pumping uh, some fuel off. Are you, are you aware of exactly what happened in the end? Uh, in terms of the accident? Uh, well, actually, I'm interested in that as well, the accident, but also <laughs> what was done to try and prevent um, the worst of that possible impact. Okay, so the accident is presently subject to an investigation. A lot of the details of what happened are not uh, in the public sphere. There's a lot of speculation, and I wouldn't want to speculate. So uh, the, the truth of the matter is we don't know exactly what caused the accident. We know that, that the OS-35 uh, ran into the Adam LNG at approximately 10.30 at night, that a hole was uh, uh, created, the ruptured in the... Uh, side of the OS-35, causing her to take on water, and a quick decision uh, uh, was taken by the port uh, to run her aground in order to prevent the sinking. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what is in the public sphere. And, and, and this, is, this is a fairly busy shipping port, isn't it, for yes. big and small and leisure ships, all kinds, all sizes? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, like, I, I'm not too familiar with the statistics, but I know Gibraltar is one of the, the biggest bundling ports in the world. So, uh, you know, a, a lot of ships. And the Adam LNG was an LNG carrier. So, you know, carrying a lot of liquid uh, uh, gas had, had the accident been any other way. It, this could have been disastrous twofold, right? Uh, although LNG does evaporate uh, as soon as it comes out of the tanks. But, you know, imagine a fire or something breaking mm. out on the Adam mm. LNG. It's, it's, yeah. it's hardly worth considering what could have been. Uh, we, we got away with it very, very lightly. Um, so she, she was put aground, as I said before, uh, just off Catalan Bay in Gibraltar. And the aim was, from the very beginning, was to attempt to remove the fuels as quickly as possible. There were um, some calculations being made because people were worried about removing fuels in the wrong place, causing stresses on the ship, which would yeah. break the ship in half, and that that could caught in itself cause a spillage. And so after an initial delay, um, the ship split in half anyway, under the tidal stresses. And take into account that Gibraltar only has a tidal range of about 1.8 meters, so from, from low to high. So, you know, imagine if this had happened in the Bay of Fundy or something like that, you know, with a 12 meter tidal cycle. This is, this is a child's play compared to even the UK tidal ranges. So um, she broke under those stresses 
and a little bit of oil did leak out. Um, and so then it was all hands on deck. There were booms that had been placed around the ship uh, in order to protect it. That was upgraded to a double layer of boom in order to uh, better insulate and protect the oil from escaping. Uh, there were skimmers put in place in order to suck up all of the oil before it escaped from the uh, boom area. And there were ships in place. Sorry? Can you describe what a skimmer is? So there are various types of skimmers. Uh, it, it, again, this isn't my forte, but essentially they're like hoovers. Um, and they're different, they're different uh, models of them. So some are like brushes and others are, are, are like little wheels. What they basically do is they skim the surface of the water. They collect the oil and they remove the water. So you're recovering uh, as much oil as you can from surface water before it starts mixing within the water column. And so these were deployed. We had a number of vessels which had uh, mobile booms, which could be moved in order to try and capture any oil that slipped from the area. And skimmers were placed there to try and collect those, uh, uh, those deposits as well. Um, and fortunately, the 500 litres, uh, five, not litres, 500 tonnes of fuel was uh, pumped out of all, all of the tanks uh, through some quite difficult circumstances because the fuel at the front was actually underwater. So the, the, the tanks had actually gone underwater. So in order to open up the tank to connect in order to suck the fuel out, you had to, uh, you, they, I'm not sure what they did, but they had to work around the fact that if they opened the tap, essentially water was going to pour in and it was going to cause a disaster. But they managed to uh, get, uh, get the pipes in there and they managed to suck the, the oil out. Um, and that was using divers from what I, from what yes. I picked up. Yes, yes. So divers went and did a lot of the assessing. They uh, found the places to enter the, the tank and they, they did all the connecting, uh, but they removed the fuel. Um, and now what we've got left in the vessel <clears throat> are the remnants of uh, fuel that are in the lines or at the bottom of the tank that really is very difficult to remove. Right. Uh, and so in all of that, I know that some, some of the oil, some of the diesel did escape. And I have seen some images of birds being oiled, but what was actually being done to try and help the, the birds that were oiled? So the Department of the Environment, alongside three NGOs, so we are one of them, the Nautilus Project, GONS, the Gibraltar Ornithological and Natural History Society, and the Environmental Safety Group, the ESG, all got together and we created a bird cleaning station. Um, the government put up the premises for that, expecting the worst. Um, and the idea was, is that we started um, patrolling the, uh, the coastline, looking for any birds that were in trouble, photographing them. And for the, the initial period, we didn't want to interfere too much. Uh, anyone that's done oil cleanups will be able to attest to the fact that a bird that has been covered in oil that gets captured and taken to a cleaning station actually has a very low percent uh, of survival anyway. And there is a certain amount of them being able to clean off the oil over time. So if they were able to, to survive it, it was probably better to leave them in, in situ. Um, and so we were monitoring to photograph birds and spot any birds that might be in distress. And from the initial slick, you'll see on our, uh, on our site that um, there were some birds that had big uh, black marks on their breast. Uh, but fortunately, it didn't seem to be enough to uh, cause a problem to them. And over time, those marks have gone cleaning up and it looks like the birds are coping. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen. Has the bird ingested any of that oil and will there be other effects? We are still monitoring that because these are longer term effects that we've got to look out for. But at least in the oil, the black stuff, uh, it seems to have you know, been a, a close shave. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, from from our point of view, for something like an osprey, uh, particularly if uh, we don't know obviously how many of them fish on that coast before they make the crossing, but an incident like this right in the middle of sort of peak migration season could have been absolutely disastrous. It's really interesting to, to look at it, but it's also uh, inspiring to think that there was a response that seems to have been really quick and expecting the worst, and everybody seems to have acted for... Uh, to avoid an environmental disaster as opposed to, um, yeah. 
It, it, I have to be, I have to be honest. It, it's in that respect, it has been fantastic. Even the public response, which I feel I really need to call out locally, um, Nautilus put out an appeal for towels so that we could use those to not only help clean the birds initially and, and get the birds if they were in distress, but so that they could be carried in those towels, and be able to wipe off some of the the residual oil, and um, and then after the cleaning, actually have them in boxes so that they could stay warm. Because my understanding. Is, is that a bird without its natural oil, what it dies from before the oil is the hypothermia caused by the lack of its oils yeah. being able to keep it warm. So it's not my area of expertise. So I'm glad you can, you can verify that yeah. for me. But, um, so we had these towels in order to create bedding as well in case they needed to, to stay warm. And we put out an appeal to the local community for secondhand towels, towels that people didn't want. And not only did we have uh, like thousands of towels uh, delivered uh, to us, uh, and toothbrushes, by the way, to help with the, the, the cleaning process. But lots of people actually went out and bought new towels and bought new toothbrushes just to make sure that, that uh, all the NGOs had the equipment that we needed should the worst happen. So, you know, a massive, a massive thank you to, to the community for their response, because honestly, we couldn't have been that prepared without, without them caring so much. Yeah, that is uh, that is inspiring, and I take it the the government uh, kind of reaction seems to have also been fast and supportive and collaborative with NGOs. Is that right? Absolutely. So all government departments uh, went out. I mean, uh, because we were NG uh, NGOs, we were outside of the main talks that were that we were taking place between the port, the governments, and and, and various cleanup uh, agencies. But we did work with the Department of the Environment um, in order to deal with the, the potential cleanup aspect. And the other thing that, that we were involved in, in areas where oil did come ashore, the, um, we all worked together in order to remove the contaminated soil or rocks or whatever from the area to try and limit the impact of the oil in that area. So from now on, it's basically just a case of, well, ideally there'll be some assessment of the, the state of seafood uh, in the area. So I think really we've got to start monitoring all the impacts of the oil, all the possible impacts. <clears throat> Any bird that, that happens to, to die, you know, over the next certainly six months, maybe even 12, should be carefully assessed to see if, um, if uh, you know, that has been as a result of, of the oil in order to ascertain what the impact of the uh, whole ecosystem is. From our perspective, we've been conducting shoreline surveys both in and out of the water in order to assess the vertebrates that have been uh, uh, impacted. And one of the unfortunate uh, casualties of this has been Patella ferruginea. Now this is the ribbed limpet. Um, its significance is, is that it's an endangered limpet uh, whose population uh, outside of Gibraltar is actually very, very low. Um, it's protected by the EU Habitats Directive and it is protected by our own Nature Protection Act. Um, and we found evidence of these limpets, A, being affected by the oil and moving off their uh, home uh, spot, but of actually falling off the rocks and being consumed by fish uh, as a result of the weakness. So there has been mortality of, of protected species, which we have been documenting and passing on to the relevant uh, government organizations that are mm -hmm. uh, handling this. And when you say home spot, for those that don't understand what a limpet does, you can see a mark on a rock where a limpet likes to hang out. So limpets have it have its home groove, and, and remember that limpets are snails. So uh, what happens is is that um, its origin point, it, as it goes growing, it'll always return back to the same spot on the rock. And as it grows, it continues to carve out that little niche. And the reason why this is important is because it can hold water in uh, underneath its its shell uh, over the tidal period so when it's low tide and they're exposed they've actually got some water then the tide returns um, and and so it's important that they have uh, their home spot imagine um, a limpet giving up its home spot it's a little bit like you giving up your home you'd only do it under extreme circumstances right in a war situation or if there was a fire where your house burnt down you wouldn't just leave your home because you fancied going to live somewhere else um you know and, and these are signs of stress within the uh, ecosystem so yeah thank you very much it's been wonderful
Thank you very much for having me. It's it's like it's it's also inspiring for me to uh, have people that are interested not in the work we do, but in the environment in general. That it's not just a small group of people here locally. That you know that there's some international attention onto this. It's yeah. important to spread the message. So thank you for the work you do. Thank you.